privilege to connect with you just a moment. Um, I would just want to tell you a little bit about myself and, and what God used. I believe we live in one of the greatest communities, and I travel all over the country in, in, in anywhere in the United States. Can anybody say hallelujah today or whoop? Uh, we live in a great community. Believe me, I've been around a lot of communities, and I help a lot of ministries and churches and, and other communities. And to live here in the Brazos Valley is just an incredible honor, and I'm so proud to be able to say I was born and raised here. Amen? And so a lot of people think and we see things in the paper and we see things in other parts of the nation and think that possibly couldn't be here. But uh, we need to open our eyes, church. Amen? Amen? Because things are going on. Growing up in this, in this, in this area and growing up in my life, I grew up and my parents were great uh, people and, and they grew up very, very poor and they wanted to get a better life and, and for my dad to be able to uh, buy a house in the 60s was really high cotton, for, especially for Hispanic. Uh, to buy a house in the 60s and so but he worked a lot and 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 some things that I've, I haven't shared but I want to be transparent but being born out of wedlock was not heard of in in the world back in them days it happened but you really didn't hear about it, it was frowned upon much less in an adulterous relationship it was frowned upon and and I grew up it, let me tell you something kids are not dumb they can pick up on things and they know what's going on and growing up and I began to get this, this chip on my shoulder and this anger and this bitterness and this, this hatred trying to figure out who, what, what, what cloth I was woven from. Everybody wants to know where they're woven from and growing up and, and, and my parents, my mom worked four jobs. She was, the, she was the one, the disciplinary and let me tell you something, I don't know who you are in here but I don't know what ethnic group you come from, but you've never been truly disciplined till you've been disciplined by a Hispanic woman. I don't know about any other ethnicity, but when you've been disciplined by a Hispanic woman, because every syllable is a whipping. And I just wanted her to be quiet, because if she was quiet, that means she wasn't swinging nothing. And and I told my mom, you could be a repeat offender in today's days. <laughs> Amen. We couldn't call 911 because we had rotary dials. Some of you young people are near. What is he talking about? Yeah, we had the nine. By the time the nine went around, you were knocked out. <laughs> Amen. I didn't live. It, there was no such thing as time out. It was knocked out. I lived half of my childhood knocked out. Amen. But I grew up, she was tough, but she wanted the best for us, and she believed that education was a ticket, and I was an Aggie wannabe. I used to steal bikes from the west side of Bryan just to come sneak into the Aggie football games and, and then steal another bike from some of your Aggies. It, it, uh, Statue of Limitations is here, so if you're a police officer, <laughs> you can't get me, amen, because it's kind of went... And then go over there, and I, I just, and, and at 13 years old, I started hanging around heroin addicts. One of the things that my parents forgot to do was to spend time. My dad would be gone for two or three weeks at a time, driving cross country. And he did the best. He loved me, and he gave me his name, and, and he loved me, and he took care of me, but he was not there. Uh, I did Little League by myself. I, I was a state wrestler, and, and uh, I wrestled for our local boys, boys club, and I was the only different color person uh, in our, on our wrestling team, so I grew up having to fight, and so I used to like to fight. I had little man syndrome. I was never this big. And so I grew up fighting. I would fight King Kong. It didn't matter to me. And so kids would follow me around school to see what I was going to get into next because that Mexican was crazy. He would fight anybody. And, I started dealing drugs and I, I, I hung out with my brother. My mother would make me hang out with my brother so I could tell on him. And so I would tell him, if you don't let me do what you do, I'm going to tell on you. And so I would do the same things he do and his friends became my friends and I hung around older people. And, and at 13 years old, I started hanging around heroin addicts. And, 
and I would help them shoot up and I would see them and that's why I hate needles. You can point a nine millimeter at me and I'm not afraid, but if you point a needle at me at the doctor's office, I'm about to pass out and they couldn't believe it because you're a tough guy and you don't like needles, but I saw that and I remember one day in particular, I was helping this guy, I was taking care of my brother's apartment and, and I was next door and it was real cold outside and got a knock on the door and it was one of those heroin addicts that I used to hang around with and, and he asked me, come help me hold him and, and hold you, what are you talking about? I'm 13 years old and I'm holding this guy's arm and he said, hold me until I hit it. Once I do it, let me go because you can hurt me. And so I'm holding him and he's got tracks all up and down his arms and you can see just pus and big old knots all up and down his veins. And I thought he was gonna go next to the knots and the scabs and stuff, but he went right into the biggest knot he had with pus and stuff. And I'm like, come on man, hurry up. And I'm trying to hold him. And, and that was back when black tar heroin was really wreaking havoc upon our nation. And, and uh, he pulled it up and it looked like dirt. And, and pulling up in his syringe, and he pulled it up in his syringe, and he was over there digging inside his vein to hit his veins, and I was like getting kind of queasy, and I was like, hurry up, and I remember he shot up in his vein, and he finally hit it, and he literally overdosed right in front of me with the needle still stuck in his arm. He's out, and I'm freaking out. I'm a 13-year-old kid. I'm thinking I killed this guy. I'm killing this guy. I didn't know what to do, I didn't know where to turn, and I was like, what do I do? We're in a little bitty apartment. I opened the door and maybe I can get some wind to him and maybe he'll come to, and I'm running back and forth, my heart is racing, I'm like, I'm going to jail for killing this guy, I didn't know what to do, and I don't know if I called out to God because I didn't know God, I just was, just I didn't know what to do, and I opened the door and he finally, uh, uh, you know, finally I, I pulled his chair, I couldn't hardly pull him, and I pulled his chair close to the door, so maybe some of that cold wind would wake him up, and the needle is still dangling his arm, and he finally, finally he starts turning gray, and I'm freaking out, and this guy finally, you know, gets, comes to, he kind of takes a deep breath, but he never opened his eyes. His eyes are just going in the back of his head, and he finally takes a break, and he comes to, and he takes a breath, and he kind of started coming to. As I saw as he was breathing, I ran out of that apartment, and I said I'd never become a drug addict. At a young man, I started selling drugs because my brother was a drug dealer and I started taking some of his stash and started selling it at my school and I was making enough money. I was making more money than teachers were making more money. And I would drive to school and I didn't even have a license. I had a car and teachers, I had better cars than the teachers did. And they were like, you can't drive that here. You don't have a permit. So I would walk down the block and then at 16 years old, I'll never forget this day that I I, one day my mother was trying to get a handle on me because I wasn't going to school. You know, when you're 16 years old, you got a little hair up under your lip. You think you can, you think you know it all. You're Mr. Big Bad. I know I can, nobody, I'm a man now. I can handle it. You ain't a man till you truly paying your bills and ain't nobody paying your bills for you. That's when you're truly grown. And all the grown people said, Amen. this is a participating sport. This is not a spectator sport. <laughs> Don't try to fool me here because we're a and and I see you at the football game, so don't try to do that when it comes to God because God, y'all ain't talking to me in here. I need to hear something back from you. We're Mexicans, so we talk with our hands. You know what I'm saying? So let me hear you and let me see you. And, and, and I'm living that life and I'm selling dope all over the place and I'm selling drugs and I knew how to get in and I hung around older people Guys that were 18, I'm 16, they're 20 and 25 and 30 and at 16 my mom was trying to get a handle on me because I wasn't going to school and I was getting in fights in school and they were wondering what, what, what they needed to do with me and he finally she wants to, and I, I remember that day she told me to be home at 11.30. <laughs> my, my mom lived on the other side of the house and I lived on one side. My older brother and sister had already moved out and I had a younger sister and and uh, I lived on one side, I knew how to sneak in and sneak out of my house, and my mother never knew whether I came in or came out. And she was waiting on me, told me to be home at 11.30.
So I had my friends, we used to live on a dead end street, man. My friends dropped me off and they dropped me off. I said, don't you dare, whatever you do, don't make no noise. My mom told me to be home at 11.30. So I knew my stashes because my mom wasn't dumb. She knew how to get my, go and look for my stash and she would throw it away and I still owned people. And uh, so I would hide my stash and I would never leave home without my 38 special. I always had a 38 special with me, nickel plated. Pearl handle, I don't know, excuse me, I just went back for a minute. I just liked it, and you had to carry a weapon because even your friends, when you got drugs, you always have friends, and you have a lot of so-called friends, but they're really after your drugs. And uh, so I, I hid my stuff, and I walked into our, and it was pitch black. We didn't have no street lights back then, and I'm walking through my garage, and my mother is waiting on me. It's three o'clock in the morning. And all of a sudden, I, a sneak attack, you know, the element of surprise. I didn't hear no words. I just heard like a swarm of bees. I thought somebody was trying to steal my drugs from me. So I started swinging in the darkness. I didn't know who it was. And then I heard my mother. She said, I've been calling the hospital and I've been looking all over. I told you to be home at 1130 and she was whipping me. And all my anger from being a young man and not knowing who I was came upon me. And I, the day that I regretted the most, I ended up grabbing the belt and pulling my mom to me. And that day I cussed my mother out. And my mother kicked me out of the house and I said, fine, I'm leaving. I moved to Houston, Texas. When you live in a college town, you have a high demand for drugs. I started getting with Puerto Ricans, Africans. I started meeting people. I was moving drugs back and forth from College Station to Houston. I went to Mexico and got enough arms to overtake a small country at 16 years old. Then they stole my car and they asked me, uh, uh, you know, what are we going to do? And all my friends were going to move back. And, I didn't know whether I wanted to move back. I had been gone for about a year, a little close to a year, and I had quit school. And, and, and uh, the last person I wanted to call was, and man, I waited for my friends to get out. We had the rotary dial phone, and I waited for my mom to get out, everybody to get out of the apartment, and I finally called my mom. And I said, Mom, and I thought after all these months that she would be glad to hear from me because she didn't know where I was. And, I thought maybe she would be happy for me, but this is a Hispanic woman. And, and, and I thought that she would be so happy for me and, and, and happy to hear my voice. And, and I said, hey, mom, yes. I said, this is JJ. She said, Yo, what do you want? And that anger started building up on me. I was about to cuss her out again. And then I didn't know how to ask her. She said, boy, I'm about to go to my third job. What do you want? And I said, uh, they stole my car. And they said, uh, she said, what do you want me to do about it? And I said, man, a long pause went over the phone. And I said, hurry up, boy, what do you want? And I said, I want to know if I could come back home. A long pause. I thought I was going to hear it. And she said, on one condition, you can come home if you go back to school. And I thought, I can go back to school, get with my girls, got my little girls. I was taught in the hood, I don't care how broke you are, you always have your little swag to you. You know what I'm saying? I was like, man, I can get with my girls, I can start dealing dope. You know, a trifling mind thinks real quick. I ended up going back to school and they had to have a meeting with all my principals because they didn't want me to come back to Bryan High School. And they said, if you mess up, you have to report. And back then was Mr. Willie Pruitt. They said, you have to report to Willie Pruitt in the morning and in the evening and in the, in the afternoon because we don't want you taking people with you to smoke lunch with you. And they knew if you get into a fight, we're going to kick you out. You'll never go to a Bryan School District ever again. In the Brazos Valley, you won't go to any school. And so I was on a tight rope. I finally graduated by the skin of my teeth and the belt of my mother. And she, I finally graduated. I ran into a teacher and she said, I gave you a special grade, grade, uh, grade curve because we didn't want you back here no more. <laughs> I let you pass English. We wanted you to get out of here. I moved out about two months before I graduated, moved into a house where we were selling dope all over the place. We were, it was like a nonstop animal house, party house all night long. 
And uh, I started doing drugs and selling drugs and doing all this stuff. I vowed never to do that. I got tired. It got old. I ended up getting with somebody, and at 17 years old, a little girl was born that I said wasn't mine. I told, my, I told her that she, it wasn't mine. And I, I literally ran her mother off and said it wasn't mine, and I knew it was mine. It was just a one-night stand, and I knew that that child was mine. But I said it wasn't because I didn't want it to mess up my so-called reputation. And uh, here I am. I said, you know what? I'm tired of this stuff, and I wanted to get married. And, you know, marriage is much more than just a commitment. It's a covenant between man and God, and I didn't know those things. And, and uh, I wanted to get married, and I knew that I was dating this girl that I knew I wanted to be the mother of my children, and I knew how she was raised. And, and so we had dated for a long time, but uh, uh, dating and living together is a whole nother ball game. And uh, here I am, and now we got married, and I bought all I ever wanted in my life was my own American dream. And I finally bought me a little bitty house, three bedroom, one bath, no central air, no central heat, but it was my house. If I wanted to put a white picket fence around it, I can do that. And I brought, she was pregnant with my son. She finally had our first son, named it. We got married. All of a sudden, hell, marriage can be as close as to hell as you want to get or as close as to heaven as you want to get. It can be hellish or it can be heavenly. And it was hellish. All of a sudden, I'm, she's sleeping next to the devil. And she, we weren't getting along, so I started drinking. I had been out of the game for a while. And a friend of mine came over. I vowed never to become a drug addict. A friend of mine came over and introduced me to a drug called crack cocaine. I started it for the very first time. And very quickly, I became a $150, $200, dollars day drug habit. I was stealing stuff from my house for my own child. There was times I didn't know if I could even pay for Pampers or milk. My wife was working for Texas A&M and we had insurance and I didn't know how to get off this stuff and I wanted to get off. I thought I'd never become like this. My eyes are sunk into my head and I'm strung out and I don't know what to do. And here I am messed up. I didn't know what to do. My wife finally gets the nerve to get up, 98 pound woman, she's from the west side too, so. <laughs> she wrote a bunch of names on a piece of paper and told me, if you don't go get help, I'm leaving you and you're never gonna see these kids again. And I don't know about anybody else, but a Hispanic woman, they take and take and take, and once they're tired, that's it. You can put a nine millimeter in front of them, you can do whatever you want to, they're gone. And I knew she was leaving and I'd never see my kids. She got pregnant with my second son and I didn't know what to do. And, I didn't know what to do. And the last thing that a Hispanic macho man wants to do is to go talk to, excuse me, I'm going to repair myself in a minute, is to go talk to white people about their problems. <laughs> and last thing, I went to go talk to this guy, and this guy told me one thing that he told me. He said, Mr. Ramirez, you're a drug addict, and you're always going to be a drug addict. I didn't understand his philosophy, and I'm not talking against drug counselor. But I thought in myself, what am I paying you for? I thought if I walked out of this room, I knew that she would leave me and that would be it. And I didn't know what to do and, 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 and I'm trying to do it. You're a drug addict and always gonna be a drug addict. And then a friend came over one day. I was trying not to go get this drug, but my body has control. I don't have control. I'm used to being in control. I'm not used to being out of control. And now I'm out of control and I don't know how to stop this drug. And, and you're a drug addict and always going to be a drug addict. And this friend came over, and I hadn't seen him in years, in, in a year, and he stopped by my house, and I didn't want to talk to nobody. When you're in that situation, you don't want to talk to nobody. And he pulls up. The sun is just coming up, and I'm sitting on the front porch. I have a screened-in porch, and, and I was sitting on my steps of my screened-in porch, and I was sitting in the front, and he pulls up, and I'm like, oh, great. And he just said, hey, man, Jay, man, I was hoping I could see you, man. You're my homeboy, man. You saved me a couple of times from from some things, man, and I really appreciate it, man. You're like my brother, man. I was hoping I'd see you. I don't know how to preach to you, but the reason I've changed and his eyes got teary-eyed, and in the hood, we don't get teary-eyed. Something's wrong, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, what the heck's wrong with this guy? And he pulls out this little pocket Bible, and he said, man, I've been reading this, Jay, and it's been helping me, man. You're my homeboy, man. You're my friend, man. 
Please read it, man. I don't even know how to preach to you. Please read it. And I started to get angry. How in the world is this man, this little book going to help me when these professionals that went to school for all these years are telling me I'm a drug addict and always going to be a drug addict. I said, man, this dude, he's crazy. So he just gave me the Bible and he left. I got it and I walked inside and I put it on the screen, didn't porch and I walked inside and the following week, my wife is going to work. She's pregnant out to here. She won't even trust me with my little boy. I don't feel like a man. I can't hold down a job. And there's my, the little pocket Bible is sitting on my porch and she don't trust me. And at 16 years old, I vowed to never cry in front of nobody. You would never see me cry. And there sat my little pocket Bible and I didn't know what to do and I started to weep because my wife is going to work crying every morning because she's living in a nightmare. And she's going to work, wobbling to work and having to take my son all the way to the west side of Bryan, driving all the way to Texas A&M from the east side of Bryan and then coming back home and she don't even trust me with my own boy. I started crying, I'm by myself. And there sat that little pocket Bible. I didn't know Old Testament, New Testament. I ended up picking up that little pocket Bible and I said, God, if you're for real, please show me something. I don't even know. I just opened up the Bible and you know, it's little bitty print like this and your eyes got getting cross-eyed and, and all of a sudden a scripture jumped out. I just opened the book and it just jumped out at me and it said, he who the sun sets free is free indeed. And I got excited, and I made a big mistake. I closed the book. I couldn't find that scripture to save my life. But I knew it was in there. So now I'm struggling. You're a drug addict and always going to be If the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. Long story, I have to go quickly, because I have a word for you. And all of a sudden, a knock comes on my door early Saturday morning. I'm struggling, man. I'm trying not to get this drug. You're a drug addict. Everywhere I go, I'm in the shower. You're a drug addict. If the sun sets you free, you're free. You're a drug addict. I can't find this scripture. I don't know what to do. I'm telling my wife, we need to go to church. She's like, church? Church? And the next thing you know, a knock comes on my door. Who is it? Your drug buddy? Shh, man, be cool. If you leave, I used to leave home and not come home for two days. If you leave, I'm not, I'm leaving, I'm not gonna be here. Nah, nah, nah. I'm like, be cool, they're right there, shh. I didn't know who it was, was it a drug dealer? I didn't know who it was, so I went, we had blinds. And I went and opened my, looked through the blinds. And there is standing now my 11 year old little girl, her mother, and my worst enemy, and I'm shocked. Beautiful little girl, look just like daddy, I, I mean, I'm just looking, and they're like, you're gonna ask us in? And I went, hold on a minute. Wait just a minute, wait right there. I go into the room, and my wife has my little boy, and she's pregnant out to here. Who is it? I said, shh, she, uh, there's something I forgot to tell you. <laughs> and she just got angry, but then she was a champ. My daughter came, and I thought that was the missing piece of my life, and she came into my life, and. She stayed with me the weekend, and then the following week, they called me, and, 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 and she left, and the following week, they called and said, we want to invite you to a Christian concert at G. Roddy White Coliseum. I said, Christian concert? I'm from the hood. I got to have some cumbia, some bump, some bass, some Marvin Gaye, you know what I'm saying? I got to have some of that kind of stuff, you know what I'm saying? Not going to violins and hearts with hardware people. If you like that kind of music, that's cool. Back in my days, Lawrence Welk, I pictured bubbles coming all over the place and <laughs> violin people and bagpipes and I thought, nah, man, I don't want to. But then I thought for a minute, maybe I can be with her and I can be cool with this dude. And so long story short, I ended up saying, yeah, we go to the G. Riley White Coliseum and, and I didn't even know if you could, we you had to pay to get in this concert. When I heard it was free, man, I got excited. I had my little boy, this is April, my wife is due in June, she's not a happy camper. And so we, on the side of G. Roddy White, and I don't know why we came in on the floor, but we came in on the floor and we came right in the front and I thought, nobody knows me in here and there was 
3,000 people in the place and it was packed just like this. And I thought, don't nobody know me in here. I ain't been in no Christian place. About 20 people were so surprised that J.J. Ramirez was at a Christian event. They all jumped up and said, J.J. Ramirez. I went, oh man, they know me in here. Hurry me up. Come on, come on, come on. I told my wife, what kind of place is this? She says, I don't know. You're the one that wanted to come. And so we go sit down, and we're going to the sit down in our seats. We're sitting. Actually, we came in from that side. We're sitting right over there, right on the floor, almost on the floor, but right on the side. And I'm walking, and there's this crazy white dude yelling, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And he praised the Lord. I said, what kind of place is this? I don't know. You're the one that wanted to come. And I'm looking at him, and he's shaking everybody's hand as they're getting to him. And we're going straight towards him. I said, man, that white dude better not touch me, man. And he does the unthinkable with me. He grabs me and hugs me, man, and starts, just, and I'm like, get off of me, man. What the heck's wrong with you, man? Get off of me, man. Pushed him down, man, and then we sat down, and all of a sudden, my daughter's sitting next to me, and there's my, 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 my wife with my son, and she's pregnant out to here, and she's talking to my daughter's mother. I'm getting, ex I'm getting a little nervous. What are they talking about? And then her husband and their children. And then all of a sudden the music gets, goes down and the lights go down. And boom, boom, psh, boom, 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 psh. And I started saying, what? What? Okay. Now introducing Carmen. And it was back then in the 90s, Carmen was very, very popular. And so my daughter jumps up. So I do what she does. I just jumped up and trying to be cool with her. She's sitting next to me. Beautiful. And he starts talking about addicted to Jesus. And he said, I want everybody to do addicted to Jesus. I'm from the hood. I started throwing my west side up. I started, what's up, what's up? My wife was like, you're embarrassing me. Sit down. I'm like, man, I, I like this guy. And I finally sat down and it got melodramatic. And he started talking about this blood's for you. You can go look up that song. It can mend the heart. It can heal the sick. And he started narrating the crucifixion of Jesus and how Jesus walked up the cross. And he started walking up the cross and people were spitting at him and people were pushing at his beard. And all of a sudden I got mesmerized. I've heard this before, but never like this. And I'm watching them pull at his beard and I'm watching them spank him for your sin and my sin. And they're hitting him and they're pulling at him and they're beating him. And he falls to the ground. Boom. And they make it sound the chorus. This blood's for you. It can heal the sick. It can mend the heart. You're a drug addict and always going to be a drug addict. If the sun sets you free, you're free indeed. I mean, and then all of a sudden, all this stuff is going on and I'm mesmerized. And all of a sudden, he said, the cross fell. And he could have gone to any side of the stage. He comes to my side. And he's sitting there and he falls. When he falls, he said a splatter of blood fell on Simon's sandals. And it, and, and it fell on Simon. And he looked up at Simon and he pointed and it was like he was pointing straight at me. And he said, Simon, this blood's for you. And I heard the voice of God, not here, somewhere in here. He called my name. He said, JJ, my blood is for you. And then he reminded me of the scripture. If the son sets you free, you're free indeed to let me know it was him. And the thing I said I'd never do, I began to just break out. I began to cry. And I didn't know what to do. And the stupid lights came on, man. <laughs> I started trying to play it off, man. My daughter's looking at me. My wife has never seen me cry. I'm trying to play it off. And Carmen begins to minister. And he said, we want to pray for you. If you're here, uh, we want to pray for you. If you're bound by drugs, alcohol, he called all kinds of things. And I'm sitting on my seat. And I'm holding on to my seat. And all these emotions are going through me and I don't know what to do with them and I don't know how to handle it. And he said, if you're here, we want you to stand up if that's you. And I said, I ain't standing up. I don't know if it was the crazy white dude, but somebody stood me up. <laughs> and I'm standing up and I don't know what to do and I'm embarrassed. So I put my face in my hands and I don't know what to do, man. And I'm tripping, man. And I'm like, all these emotions. JJ, this blood's for you. And I'm trying to hold back the tears and he began to pray like he had been in my mailbox, man. And he said, if you're here and you're a Christian, I thought I was the only dude in the whole auditorium and this spotlight was on me. And he said, if you're here, we want you to go over and lay hands on the sick. We believe that if you lay hands on, on them, we believe on the laying on of hands. I felt the hand on my shoulder and I said, man, that crazy white dude, man. <laughs> and then the next thing you know, he started praying. He told me to look and it wasn't the crazy white dude. And I looked. And it was my 11-year-old little girl with one hand on my back and one hand in the air 
with tears flowing down her cheeks as fast as I can see him come down her cheeks. And he said, if you're here and you're ready to get your heart right with Jesus, we want you to come right here up to the front. My daughter reached up and called me dad. I'm not her dad. Her dad's over there. He said, dad, I want to go. I picked up that big old girl and I was the first one to come to the front. And that day I gave my life to Jesus Christ and Jesus transformed me, <laughs> set me free, never ever to give my, to do drugs again in the name of Jesus. Are you hearing me? That's not the message. I just wanted to connect with you. Hey Amen. Can I go, please? Can I go? I have a message for you. And I have a message for this church, and I have the message for the church at large. And I want to tell you, and I want you to touch somebody next to you and tell them this season, it's your season. Come on, do it. Come on, do it. Touch, touch, high five the person next to you and tell them this, this, it's your season. You got to know what seasons you're in. Some seasons, for some people, it's winter. Some people, it's spring. My favorite time is spring. Because you got to recognize the seasons that you're living because sometimes you're more vulnerable in other seasons than you are before. It's your season. I want to take you to a scripture real quick as I get ready to close. Oh my God, am I past time? Am I okay? I just got to make this point with you. First Samuel 1 through 4. Can I go? I got to hear an amen. If not, I'm going to shut down and we can go home. 1 Samuel chapter 1, 1 through 4. And he said, and when it came time for Elkanah to make offering, he would give portions to Panina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although Lord, the Lord, listen to this, the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable because the Lord had closed her womb. So it was year to year when she went up to the house of the Lord and that she, prov and that she provoked her. Therefore, she wept and did not eat. In chapter 1, we're seeing the biblical narrative of the greatest uh, prophet, the first major prophet, Samuel, getting ready to be born. We see the beginning of chapter 1, Samuel's mother is being bullied by Penina and taunted by her because of her barrenness. Hannah's barrenness prompted her, Penina bullying her. Why aren't you producing? There's nothing coming out of you. What's wrong with you? Bullying existed back then. When it came to sacrifice, Hannah was limited by the amount she could praise or give God worship she could, that she could sacrifice, meaning her praise was limited by her sacrifice. Don't you let anything limit your praise to God. Don't you let anything limit your worship to God. She's being bullied. She's being taunted. She didn't eat. You can't deny that Christians worldwide and in the United States are being bullied in our world today and in our culture. We just saw it with this young man that gave a speech in a Catholic place. And they're tripping on him. We can't deny the fact that the pathetic will always make fun of the prophetic. We can't deny that relativism will always ridicule truth. We can't deny that decadence will always mock holiness. We're in the midst of this corporately as the church. We have the culture today full of relativism, apathy, decadence, making fun of our Christian worldview. We're being ridiculed by popular culture every day. Every day we find Hannah being bullied to the point she couldn't eat anymore. She was bullied to the point she lost two things. She lost her appetite and she lost her joy. Can I tell you in here, please don't lose your appetite for God. Please don't lose your hunger for God. She couldn't eat and she didn't have no joy. The enemy wants to take your joy by life issues. Life is going to happen. The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Sometimes I got to encourage myself if ain't nobody else going to encourage me. Sometimes I got to praise God even if all I got is a tin can. I don't need this worship team. Thank God we got a worship team. 
but we should be praising God before we even come in here. Amen? Amen. I believe there are people in this room and people around who feel like Hannah and are being taunted by the circumstances around you, bullied by the voices around you, bullied and taunted by the fact you haven't seen your family saved yet. You're bullied by the fact that you haven't seen your breakthrough yet. You haven't seen your miracle yet. You haven't seen your, mar your marriage change yet. It's falling apart. Meaning you're going through a bearing stage or a bearing season. Meaning nothing is coming out. And because of that, you're hearing the voices say to you, where is your God at now? You're seeing the things around the world and these elections and these craziness saying, where's your miracle at now? Where's your breakthrough at now? Where is your anointing at now? Where is your fruit? You're being bullied by these things externally and internally. Are you with me today? She, pr she prays and she loses her appetite and she loses her joy. She prays out of brokenness and humility. She prays where nothing's coming out. Have you ever cried so much that nothing is coming out? The anguish is so bad. Have you ever been there? Is that just me? Amen. She prayed where nothing is coming out. Eli even says, is she, is she drunk? She realized that she wants, and so she told her, listen what he told her. He said, go in shalom, which means peace. But if you really look it up, it means, check this out, nothing missing, nothing broken. Can I tell this side of the room that? Nothing missing, nothing broken. You're just being bullied right now. You're seeing crazy things going on in your family. There's nothing missing. Go in shalom. She walked in peace with the best blessing. Nothing has been coming out. It's broken. Was Samuel born yet? No. Was she pregnant yet? No. But she walked in peace. I declare to you that you're about to give birth to something in this church and in the church worldwide. Are you hearing? In the United States of America, we're about to give a birth to something so great. And it's just not going to satisfy the moment. It's going to silence all the voices that's ever trying to tell you you're never going to amount to be nothing. Are you with me today? Yeah. Amen. Your miracle is coming. I want you to look at the time and the date right now. And when I came over here, I know some of y'all looking at your time. I heard a guy say y'all a bunch of clock watchers in church. Y'all watching the clock. Amen. I declare to you that your barrenness is over. Amen. Penina is now about to be silenced. You got to be careful about the Penina spirit. This is what God wants you to impart to you to this season. That God is about to give birth to your miracle so great that it's going to silence all the enemy. Everything that's ever told you, you'll never amount to be nothing. When I did the first tent revival, they put me in a room. I used to be intimidated by white people with education and money. And somebody came to me and said, what's your vision? I said, God told me to put a tent revival right in the middle of the hood where Frankenstein and Dracula don't like to go down there at night. And he said, and we were meeting in this room and, and everything was telling me you don't belong and all the taunting voices were telling me you ain't got no education. All the taunting voices said you don't even have a seminary degree. All the taunting voices were telling me to run out of this place. And we sat down and they said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to put a tent. How big? I don't know. I just know I'm supposed to put a tent. How much money do you have? That's when my heart really started. I don't have nothing but lint in my pocket, brother. He said, what size of tent do you want? Let's call down there. And they called down there and it's the tent that we wanted cost a thousand dollars. You might as well say a million to me because I was broke, busted, disgusted, and couldn't be trusted. Are you with me? I wanted to run out of that place. Every taunting voice was telling me, you don't belong here. What if I would have ran out of that place? I was fixing to run out of that place, $1,000. What about porta potties? More money. What about uh, uh, insurance in case somebody gets hurt? We're in the hood. Ching, ching. I just started hurting. Ching, ching. Jay, you need to get out of here. You need to run. I was about to run. I was sweating bullets. I was ready to run. And a man passed by that I didn't know who he was, an older gentleman. Obviously, he was an important man because everybody stood up and waved at him. 
He went and about 15 minutes later, he came back and he said, I never start my day. He was the owner of the bank at the time. He said, I never start my day before I pray. I pray at my desk every time before I start. And God told me to give you this. And he slid a thousand dollar check across that table. We ended up doing the tent revival. We saw over 150 gang members and drug addicts get saved. Thus, the ministry of SOS Ministries was birthed. Are you with me today? We have a, we have a vocational training school. We have, we have a school. They used to kick me out of school. Now I'm building schools. What if I would have ran out of that place? Amen? What if I would have ran out of the place? This is your season. You've been through a brokenness, a time of purging. Nothing is being born. It's time to eat again. It's got, I'm talking to the pastors in here. It's time to go back to doing the things you weren't able to do because of your barrenness and your brokenness, even though you haven't seen it yet. You might not see it this very moment, but I promise you, if you'll get up and eat, if you'll get up right now and begin to worship God and give God a shout of tri voice of triumph in this place right now. I said if you'll get up and is your miracle here yet? No, but it's about to come. If you'll get up and just begin to worship God, and you'll just begin to say, you know what? It's time for me to eat again. It's time for me to live holy again. It's time for me to live right again. It's time for me to go. I don't see it yet, but I'm giving him praise because I don't care what happens. I know I serve a mighty God, and he's able to do exceedingly and abundantly more. It's time to sing again. It's time to preach again. It's time to dance again. It's time to live holy again. Even though you haven't seen it, it's your season right now. Would you give God a praise today?